Alzheimer's disease doesn't happen overnight, right? You don't wake up all of a sudden one day with severe memory problems or severe impairment. This is something that happens over a really long period of time. And they used to kind of jokingly call it old timers disease because it used to be that only very elderly people would get this. You know, oh, grandpa's senile, grandma's losing her mind. And now we're seeing people in their 50s and 60s. So ever, ever younger people are getting this. Alzheimer's is one of the leading causes of death across the United States. Its prevalence is staggering with little to no treatments available. Pseudo named type 3 diabetes, the latest research on Alzheimer's is showing us a different side to this neurodegenerative disease. Have we been looking at it all wrong? Well, today on the podcast, we welcome nutrition specialist and author of The Alzheimer's Antidote, Amy Berger, to give us the answers. And hey, if you're enjoying the podcast, make sure to hit the subscribe button and notification bell so that you don't miss any of the amazing guests that we have coming up on the show. And with that, let's just jump right into it. So thank you, Amy, again, for being here on Road to Recovery Podcast. Last time we had a really fun discussion about ending people's carb confusion and low-carb diets, the dogma around just diet kind of culture in general from several different angles. But today I wanted to kind of dive into one of the other books you helped work on, which was Alzheimer's Antidote, which also focuses uh, somewhat on diet, but also kind of goes into some of the research around Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid placking that goes on in that. Are we focusing on the right areas of that disease process? And there's just a lot to unpack, but let's kind of just roll back and kind of go back to this idea that people on some level call Alzheimer's type three diabetes. And maybe you can explain why that is. Yeah, yeah. If if people are wondering, so I'm a you know a low carb oriented nutritionist, and if people are wondering why on earth would somebody with my background write a book about Alzheimer's disease, yeah, they they regularly refer to Alzheimer's disease now as type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain, and where that comes from is that the primary problem in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's is that affected regions have lost the ability to metabolize glucose. And, you know, under most quote unquote normal circumstances, glucose is the brain's primary fuel. And so if your brain is not able to to break down glucose to get energy, it's as if these, these cells are kind of starving to death. So think of it as an energy shortage in the brain. And if your neurons do not have enough energy, they're not gonna function properly. And so the outcome of that is the memory loss and the personality changes and all of those things. Um, those are the symptoms, right? Those, those are not the disease, the disease, is is what they call um depressed or decreased brain glucose metabolism it's it's that fuel shortage yeah i mean i think i mean I, I, as i've learned more about um just i think uh, a lot more of these complex disease processes whether it's like als or parkinson's alzheimer's all these different neurodegenerative uh conditions even some autoimmune diseases like ms it's it's really fascinated me how I think uh, in some ways, uh, conventional medicine misses, has been missing the mark on, I guess, what is at the root of the problem because a lot of times we focus simply on the symptom or what we visually see is changing. And now we're noticing, like you mentioned, in Alzheimer's, uh, this uptake of glucose in the brain isn't occurring as efficiently as it should be. So when we see maybe like the beta amyloid placking, I think it's beta amyloid 42. Are we trying to, are we focusing too much on the plaque and, and not on what's causing the plaque? But the plaque is actually not necessarily the bad guy. It's the mechanism trying to go in and fix some other problem that's going on. But then it's just creating more problems in the body by kind of over accumulating. Yeah, it's um you you're kind of exactly right, but before um before we even get to the plaque, if if we could mm -hmm. take a step back. Always. And um this you know, people Alzheimer's disease doesn't happen overnight, right? You don't mm -hmm. wake up all of a sudden one day with severe memory problems or severe impairment. This is something that happens over a really long period of time and 
they used to kind of jokingly call it old timers disease because it used to be that only very elderly people would get this. You know, oh, grandpa's senile, grandma's losing her mind. And now we're seeing people in their 50s and 60s. So ever, ever younger people are getting this. And the, um, the reduction in the brain's metabolism of glucose is actually measurable in people as young as their 30s and 40s. And the thing is, when people are that young, even though this problem is already starting to develop, they don't have any signs or symptoms of dementia or cognitive impairment because they're still young enough and healthy enough that the brain is compensating. And it's only when that problem, that fuel shortage has gone on long enough and become severe enough that the brain is not able to compensate. That's when you start showing the signs and symptoms. But by the time you start showing those first signs and symptoms, the problem has been brewing for years and sometimes decades. And so that, that might be part of why it's so hard to make a dent in this. Um, and there's other things, you know, I, I don't want to forget to mention that we, we're focusing mostly on the sort of type three diabetes angle of all this, but so many other things can cause cognitive impairment or dementia that I would not call Alzheimer's disease. Like for example, a vitamin B12 deficiency alone all by itself can cause cognitive impairment or other neurodegenerative things, things that look like MS, things that look like Parkinson's, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency is sometimes misdiagnosed as things like MS and Parkinson's. Um, untreated, undiagnosed hypothyroidism can do this. So there's other things, just so people are aware, but we're mostly focused on the glucose thing in the brain. Um, so the, the amyloid, for a long time, it was thought that the buildup of these amyloid plaques in the brain is causing Alzheimer's, right? Okay, there's all this amyloid for some reason, and it's kind of gunking up the works for lack of a scientific term, right? It's just getting in the way. And that's kind of true. That does happen. Um, a lot these amyloid, they're protein fragments that build up outside the cells and they build up and they solidify and like cross link with each other into these infamous plaques, except everybody's brain produces amyloid. Every, healthy people, everybody produces amyloid. The problem in Alzheimer's disease is that for some reason, it's not cleared away properly. It just sits there and builds up. And um, it's another thing to realize is not only does everybody produce amyloid, amyloid is not causing Alzheimer's because when they, um, if they do an autopsy on somebody that had that either died of Alzheimer's or people that don't die of Alzheimer's and they can dissect the brain and they look for these plaques. And plenty of people who have Alzheimer's, who die from Alzheimer's, do not have the plaques. When they get all top, their, their brain or they have a very low level of plaque, not a level that you would expect to be causing the severity of the disease they had. And then um, other people who die very, very elderly, very healthy, they just sort of died of old age, they get autopsy and their, their brains are riddled with plaque, plaque everywhere. So you can have lots and lots of plaque and not have Alzheimer's and you can have Alzheimer's and not have lots of plaque. So clearly this plaque is not causing the disease or if it is, it's not by itself, it can't cause it because you can have the disease without lots, you know, you know what I mean? So, um, there's there's a new school of thought that the, this plaque might actually be protective to some extent it's antimicrobial it may have some other protective properties and it is true though that when it starts to build up and build up these these proteins it forms these plaques and those plaques do physically get in the way of these neurons talking to each other and sending you know impulses back and forth and so then the question becomes why are they building up and I don't know, I don't know how far you want to get down there, but there, there is a reason they build up. I, I think it'd be really interesting to discuss because I think a lot of people, um, I think they, I, 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 I like getting into the weeds. I like getting into the weeds and stuff like that. But maybe just before we kind of, kind of go into the jungle with our kind of sharpened machete here, we can, uh, we can kind of discuss some of uh, the reasons you uh, initially got interested when you were working on Alzheimer's antidote. What kind of led you um, into that area of study, and kind of what was the antithesis of 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 that book's creation? I guess what was 
either maybe the research that uh, one or your co-authors stumbled upon that you're like, oh, we need to we need to dive into this because there's something more here than that's being said. Yeah. Um, I owe Gary Taubes a debt of gratitude. I'm sure you know who he is. Your, mm. your viewers and followers must know, you know, mm. the author of Good Calories, Bad Calories and Why We Get Fat. His new book is The Case for Keto. His book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, was the first place I ever heard about a potential link between glucose and insulin and Alzheimer's disease. And when I read Good Calories, Bad Calories, I had already been following a low carb diet for my own health for several years. Um, and so I already knew, oh, it's really good for weight loss. It's really good for diabetes and for, you know, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome kind of things. But that was the first time I ever heard anyone talk about, hey, there's, there might be something with Alzheimer's with glucose and insulin problems too. And I don't have any family history of Alzheimer's, but I sort of filed that away as something interesting to maybe look at sometime in the future. And several years later, I was in graduate school for nutrition and I had to pick a thesis topic. And I said, what is something that I could research a little more that hasn't already been written about a million times, something that would be interesting for me to really dive into, something that I would like enjoy spending all this time learning about. And then um, something that something that there would be enough research on enough scientific literature that I could learn about it, you know? And I said, let me look into that Alzheimer's thing. Like maybe what, what's there? And I started just initially looking on, on the PubMed site, looking into some of the medical journals. And I was honestly shocked at how much there was, how much research there was, how much data. And I was like, holy cow, this is everywhere. Why isn't anybody talking about this? You know, and I, like I said, I was already eating low carb. I was already fascinated by all this and I had never heard of this. So let alone all the other people out there that don't know anything about low carb, don't know anything about keto. There's no chance that they've heard anything of this. So um, I did my thesis on it and I, I did not, not just this whole type three diabetes thing, but what is the potential? And I emphasize potential. What's the potential therapeutic role of maybe a ketogenic diet um, or even exogenous ketones? We can maybe talk about that later, but um, after I graduated, I said, you know, I really truly believe this is life changing information and no one's going to know about it sitting on my professor's hard drive, you know? <laughs> so um, I, I turned it into a book and I was lucky enough that a publisher, I self published it as a little PDF and a publishing company found it and, and basically offered to publish it as a, as a real book. And so, um, but that's, it's, it's, it's a new frontier for all of this, not just Alzheimer's, but they, they are researching keto for Parkinson's and MS and um, mm -hmm. ALS, not as much. That one's probably the most mysterious of all of the neurodegenerative disorders. But, you know, they're looking at keto for migraine and for, um, of course, it was originally an epilepsy diet to begin with, fatty liver, depression, bipolar, so many different things that have nothing to do with weight loss, nothing to do with diabetes. Um, but what we are learning is that so many of these conditions may have at least some relationship to very disturbed blood sugar and insulin regulation. And there's probably other factors but you know, the human body was never designed to ping pong up and down these crazy levels of blood sugar and insulin all day. No, I mean, I mean, the, the, the way, I mean, just the way in general that I think we, we eat over the last 100 years, maybe a little more has, has kind of changed dramatically from the, the centuries before it. it. Things are just move so fast now that in, in a lot of ways, I feel like our, our human bodies just they can't keep up on a certain level and no matter how good technology gets it's like you can't you can't necessarily beat our bio you can't beat biology to some mm -hmm. level and i feel like we just keep trying to play god in some sense and and decide that because we are humans and we have these big brains we can just do these things and they're right because we're on a, a higher pedestal than all everything around us and so it's kind of this like a little misconception i think we're learning slowly that we're like oh Maybe we can't do this, or this it usually is doesn't work out so well when we try. Yeah, <laughs> but kind of, kind of. I, I like that having that intro, so we can kind of get into 
the whole why are these um, amyloids forming? I think that's a good kind of setup for why you got interested in this. So maybe we can dive in deeper now about why why uh, you believe or what the research is saying for that. Yeah, um, one one thing I can say is that, um, well, a couple of things that I, I, I want to say. Um, my book came out in 2017, so it's, mm -hmm. it's been a few years. Yeah. And everything, not that I claim to be right about everything, but even just in the couple of years since then, more and more research has come out, all of which only strengthens the argument, um, more and more showing that chronically high blood sugar. We know type two diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's, but I want to emphasize because I love, I love the phrase type three diabetes, because I think it just hammers home the fact like, oh, this might be a blood sugar problem or related in some way. But to anyone, you know, watching or listening, if you're thinking, oh, that can't possibly be my problem or my grandmother's problem because they're not diabetic. We have to understand, and 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 we we probably talked about this in the previous show with the mm -hmm. end your carb confusion. Just because your blood sugar is normal doesn't mean you do not have massive metabolic problems. Because in millions of people, your blood sugar might be normal because it's being kept in check by very high insulin. And in Alzheimer's disease, they have shown that high insulin, regardless of where your blood sugar is, high insulin is a major independent risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. And by independent, it means even regardless of your family history, regardless of your genetics, because there is like a, a very big genetic component to Alzheimer's, regardless of any of that, if you have chronically high insulin, you are at increased risk for Alzheimer's. So you don't have to have diabetes to be at increased risk. Mm -hmm. um, so the plaques, where does this fit into those amyloid plaques? One of the most surprising things that I came across when I when I started learning about all this is um, when these when these amyloid fragments, these proteins form. And remember, this is normal. They form in everybody's brain. What normally clear, you know, when when things happen in the body, like things pop up, other things come along to clear them away. Eventually, we can't just have things lingering in the bloodstream all the time or lingering in the brain all the time. So there's an enzyme that clears away these amyloid pieces, except this enzyme doesn't just clear away amyloid. It clears away a lot of other stuff, too. One of the other things it clears away is insulin. It's it's literally called insulin degrading enzyme. And um, I I the, the analogy I use is that parents that have more than one child will always claim they don't have a favorite child, right? They love everybody equally. Enzymes in human biology or biochemistry do pick favorites. It's it's called affinity. They have a higher affinity for something, like they have a favorite child the favorite child of this insulin degrading enzyme is insulin. So when, when your body is just awash in insulin all the time, the enzyme is too busy dealing with all the insulin and it's gonna leave everything else to build up, including the amyloid. So, um, and that's, that's at least one, there might be other reasons why that stuff is building up, but that is one of them, that, that enzyme is just too busy dealing with the insulin. I think that's actually a really good point you made because um, I, I've been kind of diving into the different ways our body detoxifies from various uh, various like chemicals or toxins and and this insulin thing. And it's, it, 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 I think a lot of um, modern day um, chronic problems can come down to an excess in some material or insulin or whatever that accumulates in our body and our body is so focused on removing this one thing that it can't focus on doing the other repair work or whatever that it needs to do because we're just hammering our body with these these things all the time so it, it doesn't we don't give it enough time to catch up and that could go for like multiple multiple things we also have problems like you mentioned before with b12 and deficiencies in a lot of people's diets that kind of go by unknowingly. And then like you mentioned too, there's this genetic component. Um, I'm sure Tommy will be back. Um, but it, it just, it's just so fascinating to me. And because uh, you mentioned uh, the genetic component to this, and let me know if we're bouncing around too much, because I do this all the time. It's the way my brain works. 
I'm like, I think I'm like Alex Jones where I'm just like going all over the place and I'm just pulling all this stuff out. Um, but I was curious because certain people do carry APOE4. APOE4 is what people, a lot of people consider is the major genetic component to Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of people freak out over it. And when you mention high fat diets to those populations, it kind of has a different, it means different things for them because uh, I guess, what are your thoughts on, on them handling such things like saturated fat or just trying to do keto in general? Like, is that something they should pursue or what? Let's just talk about APOE4 to make it simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I get this question very often. Like, I'm APOE4. Is it safe for me to do keto? What should I do? And so the APOE4 is... Um, it's, it's the gene that is the strongest known genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. So if you have one, you know, we get two copies of each gene, right? One from the mother, one from the father. If you have one copy, you're at increased risk. If you have two copies, you are at like super duper exponentially increased risk. It's something to the effect of like a 50 to 90% chance that you will develop Alzheimer's. But I always like to point out to people that if you have a 50% chance of getting something you have a 50% chance of not getting it. So what is it that's flipping that switch? Like, like you definitely have increased susceptibility, but not everyone gets it. So what is it that's triggering that susceptibility, triggering the disease to actually develop? And um, just like with the amyloid plaques, the interesting thing about the APOE4 is that um, you can have two copies of E4 and not develop Alzheimer's. And of course, millions of people who do have Alzheimer's don't even carry one copy of the gene, let alone two. So again, just like you, you can have the plaques and not have the disease, and you can have the disease without the plaques, you can have Alzheimer's without ApoE4, and you can have ApoE4 and live healthily and never develop Alzheimer's. So um, it's, it's hypothesized that the ApoE4 variant of the ApoE gene, there, there's two and three in the human species, that the E4 is the oldest one. So it's like evolutionarily the oldest one. So it was developed or evolved in a time when everything was really different about our environment, our diet, and it's just a real mismatch for the way we eat and live in the modern world. So it might not just be the food, it could be the amount of sunlight we get, the amount of movement, and, and it's it's all, it's kind of theoretical, we're not certain about any of this, it just, this is what's believed right now. Mm. Um, so if, if that's the case, then ABOE4, I do think, regardless of the fat content of the diet, the single most important thing anyone can do, whether you are ApoE4 or not, to take care of your brain health over the long term is to maintain a healthy level of blood glucose and insulin um, you know, throughout life. And that doesn't mean you have to eat a ketogenic diet. It just means to eat and live in whatever way helps you accomplish that, keeping your blood sugar and insulin within a healthy range most of the time. And so the fat, where that comes in, I don't think it's dangerous for somebody with E4 to eat a higher fat diet or higher saturated fat. The reason most of this is believed to be harmful is because the E4s, when they eat a high fat diet or particularly higher saturated fat, they tend to have much, much higher cholesterol levels, right? And, um, or higher risk for stroke, higher risk of cardiovascular disease. But this research has been done in people eating a modern Western or modern American type diet. It's not done in the context of a higher saturated fat intake on a low carb diet. Mm. Very, very different metabolic situations, right? If you're eating a lot of butter and bacon and cheese, but also a lot of sugar and bread and pasta and granola, it's different than if you're eating the bacon and the butter and cheese without any of the other, you know, sugar and starch. That being said, I have told people, none of this is certain. We don't know for sure. If you want to hedge your bets, if you want to do that sort of just in case thing, you can do a low carb diet and just go easier on dairy foods, go easier on some of the um, animal 
foods that may have more saturated fat than uh, than you know polyunsaturated. So you could do more of I, I hate the word Mediterranean, but more of a lower carb diet where more of your fat is coming from olive oil, nuts and seeds, uh, seafood, poultry. Did I say avocados? You know that kind of stuff. Like if you can still you can do that. You don't have to load up on coconut and butter and cheese and all that. So you can do that if you want to. I just don't know if it's necessary for any four. Yeah. I, I mean, like you said, like we still have so much more to learn with all these different things. And, and it comes down to, to uh, it's like, will we ever have a quote of uh, clinical, like a, a staged clinical trial where it's controlled to a point where everyone is doing just like the high saturated fat without all this other stuff. A lot of this is epidemiology, which is subject to a lot of scrutiny, kind of no matter what the epidemiology is saying. That's why every couple of years we get new epidemiology that's like, oh, eggs are great. And then it's like, eggs suck. It's mm -hmm. because we're getting this epidemiology studies, which are usually just surveys of people. And it's like, it's not a controlled way of, of doing things. And it kind of, at this point, I kind of just kind of, I, I look at epidemiology and like, oh, that could be interesting, but I'm not going to put a lot of my salt in this because it just doesn't mean too much. Unfortunately, it's also epidemiology is easier to do those studies because it doesn't require all the, all the, I guess, strictness is just kind of giving you the surveys out and, and doing a certain, certain population. Yeah. Number. I mean, I mean, that's it's exactly right. The unfortunate thing is some some the ideal studies are never going to be done because there's there's not enough money in the world. I mean, there is, but you know, you'd really it would cost billions of dollars. You'd have to isolate people from from birth. Basically, if you want to study what happens over the course of a lifetime, mm -hmm. if you get someone by the time they're five years old, we already we don't know how much of an impact those first five years are going to have. And, and, you know, you have to give them every single bite of food they eat they can't have access to anything else it it's extremely difficult to conduct those studies so we uh, epidemiology like i it's not a useless science it's no. a good it's a good place to pose questions mm -hmm. and to um generate hypotheses that then have to be tested in the trials and they they can't always be tested you just kind of have to like, like with the apoe4 thing we might never have definitive answers to the questions so i say if you want to hedge those bets but i don't know if you need you know, and, and i it's not a good feeling to not be able to give people like yes or no answers but sometimes some of this is an art it's not a science or it's it's uh in 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 an inexact science yeah and i mean yeah, i think it'll to some extent even if we do have those studies always be a little bit of an inexact science just because each of us does have a certain level of bio individuality and there's so many factors at play i kind of hate when people get uh, so riddled up in the gene work. I have a friend that is constantly super into, into genetics, but he also blames genetics for a lot of these problems. And there's just so many other factors that play into the genetics and the saying that genetics basically set up, uh, set up, like hold up the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger is such a true statement for so many of these, of these ailments. And we're only just now really beginning to say that publicly from a conventional medicine standpoint because i know uh, for a long time people just assumed parkinson's for instance was a purely genetic disease and now they're like saying something like five to ten percent of parkinson's is genetic and then so much more of it is toxin exposure all these other things your lifestyle did you smoke forever mm -hmm. all these things that just compound like you mentioned before over years of your life it's not just like a happens out of nowhere blue thing it's usually 10 20 30 years of of process in the body and that's why like you mentioned once you finally get to treating something it can be really frustrating because it's like you have to you're working on undoing decades of of problematic uh things in your body and yeah. so and I, when, yeah no oh, i was gonna say you know it's um 
they're, they're doing some interesting research now with Parkinson's and MS where they're finding a lot of the same stuff that they see in Alzheimer's with regard to the decreased glucose metabolism of those neurons mm -hmm. of the, you know, in, in Parkinson's, it's the dopamine generating neurons in, in MS, it's some of the motor neurons. There's a lot of overlap. And mm -hmm. I, I have a little pet theory and it's, it is just my pet theory, like this is not proven, but it's something I'm just sort of like, you know, tossing around my my head. I think some of these might actually be the same disease showing themselves differently in different people. Mm -hmm. If it's the same underlying cellular problem, one person shows it as Alzheimer's, one person shows it as Parkinson's, one person shows it as MS. And I, and that could be totally wrong, but but they do have so many similarities and this really isn't talked about much. And one one of the things that really is um, unfortunate, you know, you were saying that like, or we were both saying these things take so long to develop. When people do a low carb or ketogenic diet, things like hypertension or type two diabetes or PCOS, other things can start getting better within days, literally days. Like if you take insulin for type two diabetes and you start a ketogenic diet, you might have to adjust your insulin on the first day. That's how quickly your blood sugar can sometimes start coming back to normal. Unfortunately, with these nervous system disorders, it just the the central nervous system and the brain do not repair anywhere near as quickly and i think that's probably why we don't see these like miraculous turnarounds in some of these conditions like we see with things like diabetes and high blood pressure and stuff like that yeah no i mean i, I that's very true i so I've, I've done work with um someone you may have heard of her name is dr cherry walls oh yeah who, who herself has ms and um because i myself actually have a neurodegenerative issue i have like uh basically idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, but I have a lot of, a lot of weird um, sort of health history issues in the past several years of my life that kind of contributed this. So now it's all starting to make sense. And her theories around a lot of disease and autoimmune disease go back to mitochondrial dysfunction, which you could probably say is like the root of almost like all disease, like your mitochondria are messed up. There's just so many reasons that could be. So it's kind of, narrowing it down. So I would like to kind of jump into though, um, applying this like ketogenic way of eating or low carb way of eating into uh, the lives of these people that do have Alzheimer's and kind of what you've seen over courses of time or what you meant to talk about in your book, what, what you uh, see happen with this insulin kind of coming back down and the glucose restabilizing and, and stuff like that. Basically, you're, you're just going around the disrupted pathway and opening up a new pathway for energy. Yeah, so it's um, kind of two things there. You can go around the pathway or you can fix the pathway and mm -hmm. take the pathway, you know, repair the pathway. So probably the most encouraging, most heartening thing about this whole situation with Alzheimer's is that even though these cells are not metabolizing glucose properly, they will take up and metabolize ketones. And they've shown this, thank goodness, not just in rats and mice and not just in cultured yeast cells and Petri dishes, but in actual human beings that have mild cognitive impairment and that have Alzheimer's. Um, they're there have not, you know, sadly, no miraculous reversals of disease, no miraculous 100% recoveries, but we do see improved cognition when these people get some ketones. And most of the research so far has been done with exogenous ketones. So pe I, I, people know what that is. I don't know. It's usually like a a beta hydroxybutyrate powder that you can mix in water and you drink it. But when they give it to you in a study, I think sometimes they can actually just administer it like an IV, you know. Does that does that um extend to like MCT oil? As We're exogenous? gonna get there, yeah. So MCT, yeah, so they either use the actual exogenous ketones where it's literally ketones that they're giving you, or they give you an MCT drink or or an oil that um because those fats, those special fats, your body readily converts into ketones. So, um, and all of it, all of it has been shown to be effective. Some of it's more effective than others. Some people respond better than others. Um, unfortunately, the people with the APOE4 don't seem to respond as well, but 
my theory, again, just my, my little working theory is that, that, so when you give the ketones, that's getting around the pathway, right? Okay, if we can't, we can't metabolize glucose, let's get a workaround, let's give them ketones instead. Fix, I, I think the ApoE4 is if you could go some way toward fixing the pathway, they might have a better response then. And by fix the pathway, I mean, if chronically high insulin or blood sugar or a metabolic syndrome type thing, whether or not the person even knows they have it, if that's contributing in some way, then let's use a ketogenic or very low carb diet to start fixing some of that and give them the ketones. Let's hit this from all possible angles. You know, let's let's get that insulin level back down to normal. Let's get the blood sugar back down to normal. Um, if, you know, if the person is low in B12, give them B12, give them omega-3, give them whatever else we might be low in that really helps the, you know, helps brain function. And um, so th there have been some very small studies in people with kind of mild Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, the precursor, who have type two diabetes or metabolic syndrome. And they put them on a ketogenic diet with, it's unfortunately not usually just the diet. They're changing a lot of things at once. They put these people on an exercise program, sometimes um, time restricted eating. So like an intermittent fasting window kind of thing. And it's, it's I, I've seen three or four studies that's a 10 week program and they have massive improvements in all the metabolic syndrome parameters massive triglycerides coming way down hdl going up they lose weight insulin comes down blood sugar all the good stuff happens and on the mocha test the montreal cognitive assessment it's a, a diagnostic for mm -hmm. alzheimer's and stuff like that they go from mild cognitive impairment to a normal score some some even to a perfect score meaning perfectly cognitively healthy and so I, um, something that might fascinate people. Um, so we, I, I keep using the phrase metabolic syndrome, which basically is chronically high insulin. We know this phrase metabolic syndrome. You can search online, search PubMed. They have now coined the phrase metabolic cognitive syndrome. That's how strong the ties are between the chronically high insulin and blood sugar and cognitive impairment, metabolic cognitive syndrome. So what these studies are showing is that when you fix metabolic syndrome, you fix metabolic cognitive syndrome. Now these studies where they're showing that they're really small, they're like case reports of like one or two people at a time. But if we could scale this up, um, or this is something that people can do for free in their own homes, it's a non-pharmaceutical method. You know, you don't need fancy, it's, it's food. You go to the store and you buy your groceries. Um, it doesn't have to be this kind of huge intervention. And um, it's, it, but again, these, these are not people that were very, very severely impaired. These are people kind of in a, in a more mild early stage. Yeah, it's it's um, I, it's funny. In fact, I was talking to my grandmother the other day because they're get my grandparents are getting up into their mid eighties, and um, they both have what I think most people would consider just like normal cognitive impairment, where they're sort of forgetting certain things. But I was like, you know what, grandma? It's like you know we're starting to see you heading down this certain path. So I basically sent her the book, and I was basically like, read this, and I will help you interpret anything that goes over your head or anything that or I'll help you apply some of this because I want to so I feel bad because it's like I'm kind of beta testing on my grandma here but um I, I just want to see if if we can either stop this now where it's at where you're just forgetting like the name of something every now and then because there's nothing worse than seeing someone you love enter this slow decline into into madness but into just into just being nothing it's the worst way to go. And, you know, I've, I've seen it in my other grandparents who my grandfather suffered from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And I, like, I can't even remember what his voice sounds like because the entire time I knew him was basically, for lack of a better term, in a vegetable state, mm -hmm. in a bed. And it's like, I don't even know if he knew who I was when mm -hmm. I was there. And I witnessed this in my in my in a, in my other grandmother, who, um, luckily for her, tackled Alzheimer's with a bit of humor, 
and cognitively knew she had it uh, before she went. But so many other people don't have even that luxury of going through this disease. And it's, I always hate seeing what, what I hate seeing something that you can actively do to combat anything. And then they just, it's either not talked about in a conventional setting, so they never know about it, or they just don't even try to take the step. And I'm like, if it's something as diet changes are hard, but if it is something as simple as going to the store, like you mentioned, like think about how many lives you can potentially change even in the smallest degree um, as, as they're kind of going down this path. So um, I do want to take just a minor step back. And I, this is a topic that's talked about a ton on the internet. You can find a bajillion videos, but you mentioned like cholesterol earlier and we hear like bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, all these fun things with cholesterol causing heart disease, but there's a lot of nuance. So maybe we can kind of just not necessarily go into the weeds. Cause again, it's talked about so much, but maybe just talk about a little bit of the nuance that people need to consider when they go to the doctor and they're like, Oh, my cholesterol is really bad. Uh, or is it bad? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me get to that in one sec. I just yeah. want to say, I, I don't want to give anyone the wrong idea. Like when we're talking about, you know, diet and this and that, like, I don't, this isn't like blaming anyone like, Oh, if you ate better, this wouldn't have happened. No. Like I, yeah. I hope nobody takes, takes that away from this. I mean, there's so much, there's so much we don't know, right? There's yeah. so many unanswered questions. This is like what we've been talking about is one really fascinating look at, at a, a terrible disease that I think is the most promising avenue to explore because every single pharmaceutical drug for Alzheimer's so far has been kind of either a disappointment or an outright failure, mm -hmm. right? Most of the drugs either at best, very slowly delay the progression. You still get worse, you just get worse more slowly. Or um, getting back to the amyloid real quick, so many of the drugs that were designed to reduce the amyloid were absolute failures. People that were taking the drugs actually got worse than the people taking the placebo in the clinical trials. It's not that, it's not even like it was a, it was a head to head, they got worse. So that's again the school of thought. There's 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 some aspects of the amyloid that may actually be protective. So um, anyway, yeah, and and there's so many other things that might be contributing. It may just be that this glucose and insulin is making everything worse. Yeah. So to anyone that's like, well, I don't, I don't. My grandfather was healthy all his life. He was a farmer. He was like working all day. Um, there's a lot we don't know. This is. So I I'm I merely want people to take away from this and look at it as like here's a particular path you can try basically almost for free. Um, yeah. And, 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 and no, no out. weird side effects. We're talking about yeah. healthy food. Like it's, you really, like when people say, you know, should I try it? Like, you, you kind of have nothing to lose because yeah. it's either going to be really good or it's going to do nothing for you. It shouldn't, I, I, unless, unless a ketogenic diet is implemented in a way that is not, really the right way no one ever really gets worse whatever health condition you have you either get better you get a lot better or you kind of stay the same mm -hmm. it never really does anything bad unless like if you're on certain medications you have to be monitored to adjust those meds right. but other than that yeah there's no there's no downside to trying it really i look at it this way because i'm a i'm a i'm a young strapping 24 year old when i started getting my own like neuro issues i was like you know if this is my problem let's do everything i can to even if i can't necessarily improve this a crazy amount not get any of the other problems because there's nothing worse than having more than one really bad problem on your hand right so i look at it almost as a as of like as much a precaution for anything else as I can do, um, then I think that's a win. So yeah, but that's actually a really good perspective. Like if I already have these other issues, let me at least not end up with hypertension and diabetes mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, or I should say type two, people get very, very upset yeah. if you don't specify. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, cholesterol is such a controversial thing. And what, what we do know for certain, is that the human brain is loaded with cholesterol. 
every single cell membrane, every single myelin sheath, every single synapse, every single connection between the trillions of neurons in your brain is made of cholesterol. And um, cholesterol, the amount of cholesterol flowing in your blood, so when you get your cholesterol measured at a checkup or whatever, your serum cholesterol tells you nothing not one thing about how quote unquote clogged your arteries are. It tells you nothing about the amount of plaque in your arteries. All it tells you is the cholesterol flowing in your blood. And there are so many people who have very high cholesterol levels in the blood, but when they get the scan, there's something called a coronary artery calcium scan or CAC, where they can actually measure the amount of calcified plaque in the coronary arteries, and it's zero, despite the fact that they might have a cholesterol of 250 or 300 or 400 or more, crazy high cholesterol levels, and they have no calcified plaque. And then on the other side, you've got people with low cholesterol who are on the verge of a heart attack or who die from a heart attack or who have cardiovascular disease. And so it doesn't always go hand in hand that if you have high cholesterol, you're going to have cardiovascular disease. And um, there, there's other fats and other things they can measure in the blood. I mean, cholesterol is not a fat, but when they measure your triglycerides, high triglycerides appear to be a much bigger risk factor for certain cardiovascular issues than your total cholesterol or your LDL, and especially your triglyceride to HDL ratio. The lower that ratio, sort of the quote unquote better, but even, even that, there's different ethnicities. I, I actually just learned this. Um, African-American people or people of African um, geographic origin have even if they have metabolic syndrome, even if they have diabetes, for some reason, they tend to have very low triglycerides and sort of normal HDL. So they don't, that's not a reliable marker in people of African descent. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just, and, and there's uh, Asian people have other sort of genetic things that affect those. So there's just, uh, there was a brand new paper in, in JAMA Cardiology, Journal of the Medical. Journal of the American Medical Association just a couple of days ago, I think, or a couple of weeks ago, where they looked at risk factors for coronary heart disease in women and type two diabetes, insulin resistance, obesity, hypertension, and smoking were way, way, way stronger and higher up on the list indicators or, or risk factors for coronary heart disease compared to oh, LDL. Yeah. LDL was like nothing compared to these other things. And, and to take a drug, so high cholesterol, and now, now I'm not a doctor, this is not medical advice, but high cholesterol is not a disease. It's a measurement of a compound in your blood. It's not a disease. And so um, to take a medication to lower a co the, the level of a compound in your blood that has no correlation to the actual presence of disease in your blood vessels, um, and, and statin drug, I mean, there, there's many types of drugs that lower cholesterol. The most concerning to me with regard to brain function and mitochondrial function are the statins. Because when you look at what statins do, yes, they lower cholesterol, but how do they do it? When you look at the mechanism by which they work, um, it's, it's no wonder they have all the side effects they have, like fatigue, muscle pain and weakness, um, memory loss and confusion. This is this is known on the US FDA's website. I give a talk where I have a direct quote from the FDA's website on the slide, mm -hmm. where statin use is associated with memory loss and confusion. And it goes away when you stop taking the statin. But how often are people told to stop taking the statin if they're starting to notice those symptoms? And here's the real kicker. I don't mean to keep going on and on. But mm -hmm. Statin drugs now have to come with the warning that they increase risk for type two diabetes. And there's, again, there's reasons why when you like dig way, way into the mechanism as to what, how statins work, it's, it's plain as day to me why they would increase risk for diabetes. But to the extent that diabetes, type two diabetes is then a risk for Alzheimer's. If you are, if statins increase risk for type two diabetes, then don't they increase risk for Alzheimer's?
Mm-hmm. I mean, this it's it's just nuts. And I, I, I am not providing medical advice to anyone. I'm not telling you what to do with your drugs, but you need to be really informed if you're going to take a drug that reduces your body's generation of a compound as absolutely critical to cognitive function as cholesterol is. It's, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to like unpack there. You'd almost have to do like a whole. I mean, so many people have done shows on cholesterol now. It's like you can find a bajillion of them. But I find it so interesting because it's it's like as you get older too, there's actually a, a larger danger in having too low cholesterol for your brain because your brain like needs so much of it to like you said it, it coats everything, coats all your cell membranes. All it's it's such such a vital piece to our anatomy, and I think it's kind of a myopic thing that we could go into like, oh, the Ansel Keys thing and the seven country study that he did that talked about LDL and all the cherry picking and all the stuff that never ends. But it's it's such a, I think the, the main problem is we've looked at things too myopically as a, a equals B when it's like ABC equals D, not, not a, a direct one-to-one thing. It's like right. insulin in combination with all of these other problems. And like you mentioned earlier at the way beginning of the podcast, glucose when it comes to insulin resistance glucose is the last domino to fall over into diabetes you've right. had all these other problems usually before then with insulin uh, your c peptides probably raised and uh, other stuff to look at so kind of as we kind of round out this podcast let's kind of we can kind of we'll bring it down to kind of more of a, a simple ending and kind of w- what are some simple things you think if anyone is out there considering trying to mention this to a parent or a grandparent with some sort of cognitive thing going on, or they themselves are just trying to be preventative for their life, what are some simple things they could think about implementing now into their lives to maybe, if not reverse something, but just like I mentioned earlier, maybe prevent something from happening in the near future or later future? Yeah. So um, when I get asked this question, I'm always very careful to say potentially prevent like we I think we can prevent it, but we can't say for sure that we can. not right. But right. to the extent that, you know, type two diabetes or the chronically elevated insulin and all this stuff might be either outright causing this disease or making it much, much worse then what can we do? to prevent those things. What can we do to keep blood sugar normal, keep insulin normal, stay metabolically healthy? I think definitely a low carb or ketogenic diet is gonna go leaps and bounds toward accomplishing that. But not everybody needs to eat that way. You know, some people just have a much higher carb tolerance. So not everybody needs keto. What what you need to do, I think, is eat whatever diet allows you to maintain healthy blood sugar and insulin levels. Some people are gonna have flexibility for plenty of fruit and beans. I mean, around the world, we have millions of healthy people that eat starch and they eat fruit and they eat you know, beans and grains and they're, they're, they're perfectly healthy and they age gracefully with all their faculties intact. So I can't come out and say, you know, grain is poison. And mm-hmm. so, um, but if you know that you're kind of on the early path to diabetes or metabolic syndrome, um, you know, maybe cut way back on the carbs and and make sure that you it's it's not just what you're not eating, it's what you are eating. Like like if, if you you know the work of Terry Walls, you know, make sure that what you are eating gives you the nutrients that are really critical for your your whole body and your brain, the B12, the choline, you know, egg yolks are the richest source of choline. Seafood is loaded with choline, um, iodine, um, Mm -hmm. you know, magnesium, just it it never ends. Like all of these these nutrients that we need. And then there there could be a role for, well, not could be, I mean, sleep, all of these things that we talk about. And I, I can't quantify what the relative importance is. Like, okay, the diet, is responsible for 80% of this. And the sunlight is, we don't know. Um, It kind of makes sense that all of it plays a role because when you sleep, 
there's a process that goes on in the brain where some of the, the amyloid and other built up metabolites are cleared away. And they're cleared away all the time, but it happens much, much more when you're sleeping, these, these processes. Um, again, the physical activity and, and not just like working out, you know, running or biking or something, but just being up and moving, you know, we're all sitting at our desk eight or 10 hours a day. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of moving pieces to it. And if, if your life is such that you can't do all, you, you might be wheelchair bound or you might have, you know, you might be a single mom where you don't have time to have all the moving pieces then can do your best to control the pieces that you can control. So if you can't micromanage all the other details, it's that much more important, I think, to be on point with the diet or with whatever factors you can have more control over. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very, um, I think it's a very well said answer because there's a lot of nuance. I, one thing I'd like to add to that is stress reduction. I think a lot of us lead very stressful lives, even on like an unconscious level where we don't know we're stressed but we are it reflects in your sleep uh your sleep patterns and i think chronic stress and elevated cortisol which is something that i've dealt with and i kind of look at as to a lot of my problems over the last several years um really do play a role in the way the rest of all these other mechanisms play out in your body so um, thank you again, Amy, for being here. Uh, one last time, let people know where they can reach out to you, find you. I'll have a link to her book and all these awesome things in the description. There's three of them, three books. I'm going to name them right now. Alzheimer's Antidote, The Stall Slayer, and End Your Carb Confusion. I've really had a fun time reading them. I think you'll enjoy them out there in the audience. So please, uh, I'll let you take us out where they can yeah, find Yeah, thanks so much. I, I hope people got something out of this. I hope it wasn't too, you know, up there. I think I think this was helpful for people. But um, my my handle pretty much on all social media is to it nutrition, T U I T nutrition. So that's my Twitter handle. That's my YouTube channel name is to it nutrition. My uh, that's me on Instagram, but I I hardly know how to use Instagram. Um, I'm going to be learning soon. I'm going to get help from a friend so you can follow me if you want. There's more to come. Uh, my website is to it nutrition dot com. And um, please visit adaptyourlifeacademy.com. That's very long, but adaptyourlifeacademy.com. We have some online courses based on, one of them is based on my book, The Stall Slayer. So if you are having trouble, if you're stuck in a stall or a plateau, losing weight on keto, you want to check out The Stall Slayer Masterclass. And we have a our, our flagship course is the Keto Made Simple Masterclass. So if you want keto without the tracking and the apps and the spreadsheets and the macros and the, you don't know what to do. Keto yeah. made simple masterclass. Yeah, that's great. I'll put that in the description. Cause like I mentioned, it's all those other little things when you get too focused on something that can just add more stress. And that's the opposite of what your mission is here. Yeah, don't let keto become another stressor. Keto is supposed exactly. to be simple. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now I'll point people uh, up over there to our first interview where we talk about all that good stuff. So Amy, thanks again. Hope to have you again. Thank you. Take care.